So now we move to uh, item number five. That's now item number seven. Uh, discussion and possible rejection, approval, or modification to the subcommittee's uh, recommendations on public health and use recommendations. Um, Dr. Cermak, you want to lead the discussion, please? Thank you very much. We had a, <clears throat> a very useful meeting of the uh, Public Health and Youth Subcommittee. Uh, I begin, uh, began that meeting with um, reading from the Medical and Adult Use of Cannabis Safety and, um, and Regulation Act, which uh, makes it clear that uh, the protection of the public shall be the highest priority for all licensing authorities. Um, whenever the protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted, the protection of the public shall be paramount. So I, I read that here to uh, help people understand that the, um, the law puts the protection of the public uh, directly forward. Uh, first, and so multiple issues were dealt with us, dealt with by us. I'd like to begin with the issues on the unlawful statements and false claims on health benefits, um, and we we discussed this and came up with uh, two recommendations, and I think uh, we should start with recommendation three. If you would uh, read that, please. The recommendation is that the subcommittee or the full committee recommend to all three state licensing agencies that they adopt regulations to clarify when an advertisement makes an unlawful health, therapeutic, wellness, safety, or medical claim in violation of Section 26154 of the Business and Professions Code. And we're making this recommendation to clarify it because um, I think that uh, there's a lot of um, uncertainty among the, the licensed um, portion of the industry about what they can and cannot say. And we believe that uh, regulations should be put forward more actively to clarify uh, when an advertisement uh, is unlawful and when it would be lawful regarding any health claims. Um, very good. Do we have any comments from any of the other committee members or questions for the subcommittee? So this is Catherine Jacobson. Uh, thanks, Tim, for that great summary. And I just want to reiterate that it's not that there's there, there there is confusion out there. I'm sure, but it's but 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 companies are clearly violating this this regulation already. And so we're we're bringing this to the attention of the BCC. Uh, because it's really, really important that they enforce the current regulations as they stand. And, um, you know, th there can be a, a, a lengthy debate on what's considered a health claim or not, but there are very clear guidelines by the FDA, for example, on, on what a health claim is. And if, if, if we even just started with enforcing um, that, it would, it would benefit... Um, youth especially and the, and, and the public in general um, because the message is being given that these products are completely safe to use um, and there is advertising targeting young consumers and, and we think that that's <coughs> really, really harmful. Um, so I just wanted to provide that context that the regulations already state that this is not allowed um, there are fairly clear guidelines from the FDA about what a health claim is, and it's mentioning any symptom or uh, disease-associated symptom. So uh, that's, yeah, that's the context. I just want to make one legal clarification, and that is that these advertising um, restrictions are in the part of them are in the statute, and it does apply to all licensees, not just bureau licensees. So it would also apply to the licensees um, licensed by CDFA and CDPH. Uh, 
So do you have any comments or questions by other committee members? Uh, a couple of comments. On the health claim stuff, you already have the FDA that's already proactively stepping in, uh, primarily on the CBD side of it. So whenever there is a company that's making uh, claims that they should not be making, FDA is send, sending them letters, they're sending them cease and desist letters, and they have jurisdiction over it. With the three state agencies in California being primarily licensing of regulatory agencies, is this just going to add an additional layer of regulations? Um, and is it really going to accomplish much um, with the adoption of something like this when you already have that oversight? And as we get closer to federal legalization, you have appropriate government agencies at the federal level and I guess even at the state level sometimes where they will have that jurisdiction and that oversight and they are equipped to do it. Because the other side of it is it's one thing for the three state agencies to enforce regulations on the books, statutory and regulatory. It's another thing for them to start getting into the world of health claims when they're not a health organization or a health oversight organization. I just want to so, kind of put that out there. So, C Catherine Jacobson, again, I want to clarify two things in response. One, the FDA is not monitoring health claims by companies who are, who are producing products that aren't solely hemp-derived CBD products. They're staying out of that completely. And their warning letters that are being issued by the FDA um, for hemp-derived CBD uh, claims being made by these companies are, are um, having an effect on what companies are saying. So it's, it's an effective means of, of encouraging companies not, not to make health claims. Second, we're not asking any of these agencies to determine what a health claim is or not. It's, it's actually very simple if you follow FDA guidelines. If there's any mention of a disease-related symptom, it's considered a health claim. So those guidelines are really clear. You don't need a lot of expertise to evaluate that. I think it's, uh, it does make sense for California to step in here since uh, we stepped in to say we're going to legalize marijuana. And, and cannabis, and so uh, clearly we're willing to step into places that the federal government is not uh, is leaving a void. Uh, and so I think this is a place where uh, the public health uh, priorities uh, make it an, uh, another place where California should not fear to step in. And I think you made it clear you're not looking to have any additional regs created, just what was already statutorily required. But I think that the industry needs uh, as much clarification as, as they can possibly uh, be given Very around good. what is lawful and what is not lawful. Any other comments? Mr. Yeah, the, uh, well, on the health claims, I guess a lot of it, so you got the subjective side of it and you got the health claims that are more expressed. For instance, consume this product and it'll cure cancer. That's one thing. Uh, consume this product will make you feel better um, is another thing and I guess my issue with it would be more on the is it subjective is it really a health claim are you really curing a disease are you making a claim that you're curing a disease or are you just making so for instance nowadays you got a lot of the branding that goes in it where people don't understand the strains or anything like that you got calm um, sleepy dry, whatever it is something that will uh, help you go to sleep at night is that a health claim or is it just how you're going to feel when you consume the product. So those are some of the issues that I kind of have where it's like, are you really saying, making a claim that you're going to cure a disease or are you making a claim that, hey, by consuming this, this is the effect that you're going to feel? And where do you draw that line? And if we already have it on the books and if it's already in the regulations, if it's statutory, just enforce that. Those are enough guidelines as opposed to now creating an additional layer of, call it oversight, call it, call it um, so, control. Catherine Jacobson again, but we're not asking for more oversight uh, or, or any additional steps. We're asking for clarification so that everyone does understand what the FDA already knows and what anyone who is making advertising should educate themselves about. So, th it's not a gray area. It's very clear. You can say, um, you can put things on the label, you can develop brands, you can call something calm, but you can't advertise with the intent to give people the impression that taking this product will improve a disease-related symptom. Um, so just, this is... Okay. Sure, no problem, thanks. Uh, just so, I, you know, I'm, I'm, 
I, I understand what you're trying to accomplish, but I think the, uh, at least the language in the recommendation that came out of the subcommittee is lacking uh, specificity because all, all I'm seeing there is it says, and I've turned around and read it several times trying to understand, it just says, you know, uh, clarification of when a violation of that section occurs. So, what, I mean, what's the outcome? Because the recommendation is, is just saying that you're asking for clarification of when. I mean, what exactly is the end goal here? Are you looking for clarification of when a violation occurs and then it triggers some type of response that we need to, you know, increase or change the regulation or the language on? Or are you looking for clarification as to what constitutes a uh, violation? This is, what this constitutes is a violation uh, that would trigger a warning letter? Yeah, I, I'm, let, let me respond to that, Member Nikita, because this was my motion. And really, you have Section 26.154 of the BP Code, but you have no regulations. I mean, there were a lot of regulations promulgated, but nothing on health-related claims. There's detailed regulations on health-related claims on a label but nothing on health-related claims in an advertisement. So you're in a space right now where, you know, the, the agencies or local agencies who monitor and have the ability to enforce under 17200 of the BNP code unfair business practices or false advertising don't know what constitutes necessarily an unfounded health claim that might be deceiving a consumer into thinking when they buy this product that they're going to see a benefit. Uh, a wellness benefit or a health benefit. So all we're really asking for through this recommendation is that the agency, uh, and we're not being prescriptive, but that the agency look at the statute and adopt some regulations that provide clarity not only for the agency itself when they're looking to enforce it, also the licensees who are advertising, just some guidance. Um, and if you look to health-related labeling, it, 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 it's there. And so you know what is a is you know lawful Health, uh, lawful label and what's not a lawful label in this context, and also for locals who are tasked with fielding complaints like this all the time, what, what, what do we have to look to to make sure that we're on solid ground and we're telling somebody this is a false advertisement or, or not? Okay, so that, that helps me out a lot because I think the distinction that I heard was uh, advertising versus labeling. And if, it, you know, it sounds to me more like what we should be asking for is consistency between those two. Since there's guidance on labeling, that same guidance and structure should be translated into advertising as well. You know, rather than sort of reinventing the wheel, right? Isn't, shouldn't, just, shouldn't we just cut and paste? Uh, I, I don't, this is Catherine Jacobson. I don't think that's quite right because the, the what we don't want is for what uh, Avis brought up, we don't want a, a, a company who wants to label a product as calm, for example. We don't want to, we don't want to regulate that. And, and that's the label claim. That's on the label, right? Um, we're talking about advertisements that are on billboards that um, give the impression that taking this product will alleviate a disease-related symptom, right? So, yeah, but that's my point, is that, you know, if we're already providing that level of guidance for, for labeling and we're clear about what that means, then why wouldn't we just have that same guidance apply to advertising? Because the space allotted to advertising is very different than the space on the, on the product. And, and, and the product, um, so, so let's see, we got a lot of help from Tamara on this because we went through the regulations and there was a distinction between what goes on the label and what goes on advertising. Tamara, do you remember that section? Can you read it for the committee? Um, are you referring to public health regulation on labeling? Is that yes. a section you're referring to? I think so. Miran, do you want to speak to your labeling on health Benefits, is that something? So, so I'm still, I, I, I'm just, 
you know, the, the recommendation as it stands right now is just lacking specificity. So look, I wasn't at the subcommittee. I, I don't know what the nuances were in, in your conversations, but as it stands right now, the recommendation doesn't say anything for me uh, to be able to support it. Um, and there's no real specificity aside from just saying, you know, clarification when. Yeah. So clarification when as, you know, related to an existing standard or, you know, what are we trying to accomplish here? So, I mean, you know, that's all I'm saying is if we can clear up the recommendation language, I think I'd better understand it. And, and certainly if this gets, obviously the BCC is in the room with us, but these other agencies, you're saying two other, you know, licensing agencies, you know, you want to pass that recommendation along to, but it just lacks the specificity to give them any guidance as to what we're really trying to accomplish here, unless they go back to your administrative record from the uh, subcommittee meeting. Um, can I just quick speak quickly to that? Because it did come up a little bit, and I think the part of it that makes it a more specific directive is where we say at the end in violation of this section in the code. So there's a section in the code that prohibits specific activity. And my understanding of what we heard yesterday from Tamara is that section has been implemented in by one agency, the Department of Public Health, in a rule related to a label. Um, but we're concerned that it also be implemented in regulation to all the licensed entities under all three jurisdictions in labeling and advertising. So it's the state statute that sets out the standard and the rule, and, um, and the recommendation goes to we have a regulation in this one specific context for one set of licensees, and we're concerned because um, just, I saw like three false related claims on advertisements on my drive here this morning. Mm -hmm. um, so we're concerned that we see that there's a problem out there. It's addressed in state statute in a limiting way. And how is that being implemented in regulation for all the licensees in the context of advertising and regulation? I don't think we're asking for something new um, to be added to the LARS or interpreted because we say what, what's the implementation of this? When is it a violation of this code section? I and mean, then that limits it somewhat, I think. Wait, okay. I have the statute here that, that I was referring to. So it's actually a statute, 26154 of BPC. A licensee shall not include on the label of any cannabis or cannabis product or publish or disseminate advertising or marketing containing any health-related statement that is untrue in any particular manner or tends to create a misleading impression as to the effects on health of cannabis consumption. So I was wrong earlier when I, when I thought that labels were separate from advertising. Um, it's, it's all under the same statute, and I think what we're trying to prevent is exactly what um, Tamar just said, is we, we, we want, one, to, to bring awareness to the fact that this is not being followed or enforced, and two, we didn't feel comfortable making any um, detailed um, recommendations, which is why we put in the language that they adopt regulations to clarify when an advertisement is making an unlawful claim. So, so it's complicated, right? But we wanted to bring this to their attention and make sure that, that uh, they know that the current statute as written is not being enforced and, and that something needs to be done about it and, and they should look into writing clearer legis uh, regulations to clarify it. Um, we're not trying to do the work of the agencies themselves in determining what the regulations would be, but the statute exists and it's being violated all the time. Sure. And so we are encouraging regulations which clarify how, how businesses can f adhere to and follow that statute. So, so then just, you know, again, just to be abundantly clear to those folks that we're making this recommendation to, I would just say at the last sentence there, um, you know, instead of just uh, in, in violation, I would say consistent with violations, you know, in section, right? Just to just to be able to, you know, because just the phrasing is bad. You know, let me. I mean, that's what threw me off when I'm reading all of this. Is the phrasing is bad? It's just toward the end. What you're trying to say here, now that I hear all of you speak, is what you're trying to say is you want this advertising to be consistent with the violations outlined in this section related to advertising. Uh, related to advertising. So, so just 
just say that. It makes it a lot easier because the way it's written right now doesn't quite get you to that point. It just says, you know, when a violation occurs um, related to. So, so if you I, think that the adding, <coughs> I'm sorry. If you think that adding the uh, phrase consistent with violations, uh, if you think that adding that phrase is helpful, I certainly think we would accept that amendment. I'm not sure that's quite right. I, I mean, right, I read it now to say you want regulations that clarify when, give more detail when something violates the statute, right? And that seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to, I mean, that's what regulations are supposed to do, right? That's how I read that. And, that, and so the consistency thing, I think, actually makes it more vague if you were to phrase oh, it that way. Okay. But, I mean, whatever gets us there. Look, I don't, I don't care what we call it. It's just, I'm, all I'm saying is it does, you know, when I read it, and when I'm listening to, you know, what you're saying, what you're saying is different than what's written there. So, you know, feel free, anybody, to provide clarification language. We've, we've heard everything that everyone says. I think legal has heard that as long with B BCC staff. So whatever that friendly amendment looks like, uh, I'm just saying it, it doesn't read t to what it is you're trying to accomplish. So if we could just clear that up, then, you know, 100% support this. Could I so let me just remind everybody, we have a recommendation that's before us. What we would need is a recommendation or a motion to, to modify the recommendation as written. Right. Once we have a approval of that recommendation and take public comment on it, then we would um, put out a new recommendation for us to consider. And I think we're still debating what that recommendation is. Right. I'm just letting everybody know as we're going. That's, and that's where we're going. My suggestion, I think to Matt's point, would be, you know, maybe you want to say something about they, they adopt or establish advertising regulations that mirror or, you know, are in sync with the labeling regulations. I think that's probably, that, that's clear language that takes away some of the, the, the vagueness. But, but to be clear, the labeling and the advertising is all in the same code so it's not we don't we're not clarifying that advertising should be consistent with labeling what we're trying to get at is, and I'm happy to take any of happy to take any other language that that you guys like but the the gist of it is we would like to recommend to all three state licensing agencies that they adopt regulations to clarify how about this adopt regulations to clarify what constitutes um, misleading, what constitutes a health-related statement that is untrue or misleading as set out in 26154. Is, is it that is the issue, or is it the opinion, uh, I don't want to say opinion and lead the wrong way, but the belief that there's not enough regulation being done on this? Right, is that kind of saying that, hey, you guys just need to enforce the rules? Because now you're saying, or at least what I'm hearing is that it's not about advertising versus labeling. You're saying that rule's already there. My understanding is that there's one rule in place from the Department of Public Health that goes to what goes on a label, right. and that there's not any other regulation related to marketing or advertising. So my suggestion was licenses. that we create a advertising or marketing rule that again, is in sync or mirrors that, and the, the, the response was that that's already there, which that's what's throwing me off. We want regulations that reflect the statute and what the statute says about unlawful health claims. I only thing I'd say is I'd be cautious on being prescriptive to what meets that, because what could end up happening is if you don't list it, if you become prescriptive and you don't specifically list within the regs what are excluded, then you could end up with more things that would be included um, because you've now listed what is now excluded. So be cautious. Be, you might want some stuff to be overly broad if your real concern is making sure people don't start to make, you know, unique claims. So. And to save us uh, to also add a couple of things. The way I'm reading it and the more I read it, keep spinning around, it's basically saying let's create regulations to clarify existing regulations. So it's really more of an enforcement issue than it is additional regula reg regulations and those types of considerations. The other thing to take into consideration is that this wouldn't even apply to the BCC. Um, when you've got distribution, you've got retail, you've got laboratory testing, 
none of this would even be applicable to a dispensary owner that's advertising. So, and on the cultivation side, you don't have cultivators that are making health claims. A lot of this is going to be on the manufactured goods side. And if we have existing regulations on the books, I think it's more, instead of additional regulations to clarify what's already on the books, setting up guidelines, uh, setting up clarif uh, clarifications, kind of like how we've done with other, regula other regulations in the past. I don't think the solution is creating more regulations just to clarify existing ones. Well, we, we use the word clarify. And uh, basically what we're talking about is that this statute has not been implemented. And we believe that additional regulations could be written that would facilitate reg uh, implementing this statute. Can I just ask the committee to remember to identify yourself each time you speak for our court reporter so that she can get down the accurate record? Thank you. And, and I, I'm just going to say this, this is a BMP uh, code. It isn't a Bureau of Cannabis Control code or regulation. So this would be overarching over all the agencies, right? So we wouldn't need anything specific saying that this particular agency or this particular you know, a bureau would need to follow these. They're a state agency that falls under the rules of the Business and Professional Code of the Constitution. And the, so um, I think what you're asking for is clarity and enforcement is what you're looking for. Is that? Clearly, we're asking for increased uh, enforcement. Um, but it is our belief that the re that regulatory changes could facilitate that and make it clearer to the industry what that what they need to follow in order to satisfy the statute we have regulations for every damn thing that the industry is doing but not much for this um so this is Kristen of it all um i'm i'm a little tired of waiting, sorry, so I'm gonna just jump in here. Um, the, this is really reflective of um, how all botanical medicines are addressed, right? And so I don't have any problems with seeing any additional regulations to help clarify this. I think that um, enforcement definitely is going to be a key point, but I think a, a guidance document is gonna be hugely important to the industry because um, health claims um, are different from what standard and function claims, I think, is what the botanical realm is when you talk about something being an um, antispasmodic or an analgesic, right? Those are standard and function claims. And it's not just really the advertising or the labeling. It's also testimonials on your website. Like, all, there's so many components that fall into a standard and function claim. So um, I actually um, support this this recommendation and I think that um, regulation would help to clarify it, guidance documents from the agencies so that folks know what is actually um, appropriate and not appropriate as far as statements would be helpful and then um, some method to um, enforce it. Officer Woolsey. Uh, David Woolsey, I have a question. Um, I'm, first of all, I'm fine with the recommendation as is because the goal of regulations is often to clarify statute. Fine with that. I get, I get that. Um, but what I've heard a lot is that the statute is being violated consistently or frequently and it's not being enforced against. And I don't see enforcement as, as a part of this. Is there a subsequent recommendation that the Bureau and um, CDPH and CDFA increase enforcement of the advertising violations that you say are occurring? So we do have another recommendation related to enforcement, and, and that one says we would like to see uh, full transparency of any violations that have been, or warning letters that have been given to licensees. That was in a separate recommendation, and, but I think we'd be happy to combine them, no? This is Member Nikita. I'm ready to make a motion. Um, I move that the full committee adopt the recommendation as drafted. Number three. And this is Mr. Clifford. I'll second it. I guess we had a lot of comments, but uh, public comment?
Dr. Silver, you need Can to you push your button in front of you. Please. There's a, there's a face the with a, there you go. There Sorry. You go. Your light's on. <laughs> Technology is my downfall. Um, good afternoon. Uh, Lynn Silver from the Public Health Institute. Um, first, I thank the subcommittee for their work on this, and I would like to speak in support of the motion. Um, advertisement is one of the most influential areas for the health consequences of cannabis on the market and has major impacts on youth use, um, and this needs to be much more clearly laid out and enforced. Um, we are seeing in our focus groups with youth um, in 11th grade and 12th grade, so kids who shouldn't even be seeing this stuff, uh, total incorporation of messaging about therapeutic claims that are false and misleading. I can read you some. So, you know, 11th grade sports players, if there's soreness, you're sore, it can help you get through to the next training without being too messed up. There are some long-term effects, of course, like developing brain matter, but that's just a minor issue. If you look at the broad spectrum, there are benefits for marijuana, and I have more and more of these comments showing how kids are incorporating these inaccurate therapeutic claims. Um, so I strongly support this motion. That said, this committee a year ago passed a motion, if I recall, recommending that there be no therapeutic claims on adult use products. There is a medical market. There is an adult use market. Thank you, Lynn. Adult use products should not have therapeutic claims at all, and I would like to understand why that is still being allowed. Thank you. Speaker three. Good afternoon, Cannabis Advisory Committee. My name is Dan Jojadis. I'm a lawyer in the Bay Area here, and I represent Purple Lotus Patient Center in San Jose. I would just like to add a little bit of information uh, to this discussion. Uh, I was there yesterday for the subcommittee meeting, and there are some Department of Public Health regulations on the books at Section 4410, uh, labeling restrictions, cannabis product labeling shall not contain any of the following, and this is subsection D, any health-related statement that is untrue or misleading, any health-related statement must be supported by the totality of publicly available scientific evidence, including evidence from well-designed studies conducted in a manner which is consistent with generally recognized scientific procedures and principles, and for which there is significant scientific agreement among experts qualified by scientific training and experience to evaluate such claims. Ms. Jacobson, I, I think you were looking for this language as well. Um, and it's, it's like a Kelly Fry uh, Daubert standard uh, if you're into scientific evidence. But I appreciate everybody's time today and thank you. Thank you, Speaker Three. Any other comments? If there's anybody else who wants to make public comment, please step forward and take any open seat. I didn't want to interrupt. Um, hi, Michelle Dezitzer with Cannabox. I was also um, privileged to be part of yesterday's discussion, and thank you again, everyone, for being here and participating in these very, very important discussions that really affect a lot of people, a lot of companies, so they are very important that we do them correctly. Yesterday's discussion was very long, and I really suggest we look back at the notes because there is a lot of things discussed. Um, it is very important that we understand the difference between saying medical research proof and uh, understanding what health um, down Whole Foods aisle is. So um, we have to, I think, make sure that we don't overregulate this industry as it already has been so much and limit it from uh, where it is and has become today and where we've brought it today and make sure that we don't um, forget where we want to take it medically and make sure we could get there and make sure that we are funded for the research we need to get there. So it's a balance. Um, thank you. Thank you, Speaker Three. Seeing no more public comments, Chair. Very good. So let's uh, call the roll on the motion. So the motion is that the full committee recommend to all three state licensing agencies that they adopt regulations to clarify when an advertisement makes an unlawful health, therapeutic, wellness, safety, or medical claim in violation of Section 26154 of the Business and Professions Code. Going for the vote, Babouillon. Nay. Sir Mack. Aye. Clifford. Aye. Farrell. Aye. Harada. Jacob. Jacobson. Aye. Lynch. Aye. Nevdal. Aye. Nikita. Aye. Ron. Aye. Stevenson. Aye. Sweeney. Aye. Todd. Aye. Woolsey. Aye. Wu. Aye. You. Aye. Motion passes. Very Thank good. You.
I think, that, Mike, do you have, I, I do think you have that will make uh, some other things go a little bit faster now. Uh, sure. If we could, um, I think, just move on right now to uh, number four and have that read. The full committee asks all three agencies to make public any warning letters, suspensions, and revocations of licenses due to violation of Section 26154 of the Business and Professions Code, referring to health-related claims in advertising, including on the label of cannabis products or disseminated through advertising or marketing. So this is just simply to, to have uh, any uh, sanctions be made public and not kept private. And again, I think the, 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 the subcommittee's goal here was to have full transparency so that we as the public all see whether these warning letters or, or suspensions are, are being given out. And if you've been following the FDA warning letters closely, um, ever since the, the Farm Bill and, um, and the uh, widespread commercialization of hemp-derived CBD, um, the FDA has stepped in to issue warning letters when they see unlawful health claims, and that does have an effect on what companies are now saying about their products. So this was in the spirit of, of that full transparency, um, just to bring it to the attention of the public and the state of California and all of the licensing agencies involved. I would like to see what's being done about um, un unlawful health claims. Ms. Yu. Beverly Yu, just wanted to clarify that if a licensing, a licensee went through the appeals process and the state ruled in their favor, um, made a decision on this, would their suspensions or revocations still be posted publicly? Well, I think that's a really good point, and we included suspensions and revocations and um, I think that's beyond my, my pay grade is to understand, you know, the legal implications of all of that. I think it would be up to the, the three agencies to, to make sure that no one's rights are violated, no company's rights are violated. That's a fair process. It was really the intent is to give transparency to everyone, um, including other companies, right? So when you go on to the FDA's website, you can see the warning letters that have been issued and it gives the company, it gives other companies guidance about what's appropriate and what isn't appropriate. And This is Avis. Um, to add some stuff, I really like this one because what it does is it creates a certain level of accountability and when you go through something like that, and, you, and kind of going back to the first one that we were talking about, if you were to violate something, advertisement or anything, it should be public information. It should be uh, made available to the public that, hey, this company, they've had these issues, they've had these false advertisement claims and stuff like that. And that goes more towards uh, enforcement and long-term accountability for the companies. They'll make up things twice before they chase the quick dollar and false advertisement. So on this one, I like, and, um, Ms. you brought up a really great point. Is this based off of at any point or is it based off the final disposition? I think if we could add something in there that says based on the final disposition of whatever the circumstance situation is, because it's not fair. If a company gets a warning letter and they're able to remedy it or if it was a misunderstanding and the final disposition is not a suspension, um, it wouldn't necessarily be fair for them to be able to post it up. But just to add those points to this in support of it, I think it's a really good one. Your light's on. Oh, my, no, I'm sorry. Okay. Didn't mean to be. Any other comments? Does the subcommittee want to address Mr. Babulian's request to add upon final? Dis I guess I would just add that um, in order for a warning letter to go out, there has to be a full assessment already by the, the licensing agency responsible for, for that um, licensee. Uh, in the case of, of the FDA warning letters, they make the determination that the company is in violation before the warning letters go out, and so that's already after full evaluation. And the only way to, and, and they clearly state how to remediate, and then if the company does remediate, they remove the warning letter. 
So the warning letter is, in essence, a final determination in the early <coughs> part of the process. Very good. Any other questions? Public comment? Oh. Can I get a motion and a second? I, uh, this is Lynn's. We don't have a motion yet. Motion Just a moment. Um, Avis Bullion, I'll make the motion to adopt. A second, um, Jacobson. Okay, Lynn. <laughs> Very good. So we have a motion and a second. Now we can take public comment. Sorry about that. Very quick. Uh, Lynn Silver, Public Health Institute, um, strongly support this motion. And I want to give a really positive example from BCC, the action you took against weed maps to get them to stop listing unlicensed dispensaries. The fact that that became public, hit the press, everybody knew about it, um, had a really strong public impact and exemplary effect. Um, without costing anything, without putting anyone in jail. Well, not without costing anything, but <laughs> um, I think it, it provides a really good precedent that should be followed as well for these other areas like advertisement. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker 1. Speaker 3. Hi, Michelle Dizitzer with Cannabox. Um, I think there is, needs to be also a clear differ, differ, uh, difference between um, enforcement and help guide the industry um, and who is doing the enforcement. Um, so when we think about what is already written as a you know as enforcement you know is that a fee is that a penalty and guidance as in this is not what you should be putting up on your presentate on your marketing or on your you know on your bottle because this is not you know the guidance of what we should be doing and it's not going to put anyone out or get anyone in trouble but it's helping us kind of build what we want to do I think we got to really understand the difference I think it's important that we have both we need enforcement to make sure there's penalties and we don't encourage bad behavior and there's enforcement but we also need to guide the industry and say because everyone's wanting to know how do we position this we want to do it right so we just need to I think make sure that we conquer both enforcement and guidance Thanks. thank you speaker three any other public comments back to you chair seeing none can we call the roll so the motion is that the full committee ask all three agencies to make public any warning letters, suspensions, and revocations of licenses due to violation of Section 26154 of the Business and Professions Code referring to health-related claims and in advertising, including on the label of cannabis products or disseminated through advertising or marketing. Bobulian. Aye. Aye. Clifford. Aye. Farrow? Aye. Harada? Aye. Jacobson? Aye. Lynch? Aye. Nevdal? Aye. Nikita? Aye. Ron? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Sweeney? Aye. Todd? Aye. Woolsey? Aye. You? Aye. Motion passes. And before we move on, I just want to let uh, Dr. Shermack know that uh, my goal will be to have the subcommittee continue its work since you lost a quorum at the end and had three bullet points you wanted to tackle for the next meeting in December. So hopefully you can continue work. And well, that, that would be wonderful to know that we could be meeting again in December. Uh, we, didn't have, we didn't keep a quorum long enough to be able to uh, finish uh, what was on our agenda. Um, so moving on now to the very difficult issue of um, having a process for determining what ads are too attractive to youth. Um, they, uh, th there's always going to be um, difficult calls that get made in, in this regard. But there's also clearly uh, advertisements that are uh, we want to um, not put in the in in front of uh, those people who are under 21, if it's at all possible. So we we begin this with um, saying uh, with uh, recommendation recommendation number five. Let's read that first and uh, so the recommend that. 
The recommendation is that the full committee declare that the state licensing agency, agencies should prioritize the allocation of resources to enforce laws designed to prevent advertising or marketing to people under 21 years of age. Uh, the reason for this is just that uh, what I read in the very beginning in Moxgra saying that the, that the uh, protection of the public is of paramount interest. It shall be of paramount interest. That means there is no uh, equivocation about that. Um, that should be controlling us. And as of now, there does not seem to be a high enough priority on um, monitoring and uh, regulating the advertising that uh, youth are being exposed to. Any comments, questions of the subcommittee on this recommendation? Any motions on this recommendation? I just want to make sure everyone understands what we're trying to accomplish, which is, um, you know, by by law, or the regulations already state that the companies can't advertise unless they um, they need to restrict advertising to areas where 71.6 percent of the audience is above the age of 21, and that's currently not happening, right? So, so the way we phrase it um, is that we would like them to allocate resources to enforce the laws that are already there. Um, this is Todd. Uh, can I move that we, as a committee, adopt most, this motion? I mean, uh, recommendation number five. This is Lynch. I second that motion. We have a first and second a public comment. Seeing none, can we call the roll? So this recommendation is that the full committee declare that the state licensing agencies should prioritize the allocation of resources to enforce laws designed to prevent advertising or marketing to people under 21 years of age. Bobulian. Uh, aye. Sir Mack. Aye. Clifford. Aye. Farrow. Aye. Harada. Aye. Jacobson. Aye. Lynch. Nevdal? Aye. Nikita? Aye. Ron? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Sweeney? Aye. Todd? Aye. Woolsey? Aye. Wu? Aye. You? Aye. Motion passes. So drilling a little bit deeper into the um, difficulties that, are, that currently exist in uh, uh, youth being exposed to uh, advertising that we um, do not think should be happening, and that would be uh, recommendation number uh, six, please. This recommendation is that the full committee recommend to the state licensing authorities to prohibit advertising on billboards on any highway that crosses state borders, specifically referencing section 26152, subsection B of the Business and Professions Code. This is a, uh, uh, this is something that was uh, weakened in the regulations that currently uh, exist. And uh, we believe that we should be doing, um, returning to what was in originally in the Business and Professions Code. Um, this is Todd. I'll just expand on that a little bit. Um, so the the section in the Business and Professions Code 26152 subsection B um, prohibits advertising on a billboard on any highway um, that crosses a state line. So Highway 80, you know, crosses out of the state into Nevada. So it would prohibit advertising on billboards um, along that highway. Um, the Bureau regula regulation prohibits advertising on a billboard within 15 mile on a highway within 15 miles of the state line. Um, so the recommendation to the committee is that we recommend that they um, change that regulation to comply with the code in the Business and Professions Code 26152 that would prohibit it along any highway where the highway crosses the state line. 
Just a point of clarification. Um, I, th I think it's subsection D, right, of the statute? I think that says B up there. Yeah, I'm just, I just looked it up and noticed that. But. This is Jacobson. Um, the, this might be highly controversial, but it occurs to me that advertising on any highway, on a billboard on any highway, is already in violation of the audience composition rule that exists. Because by definition, the audience in a, on a, you know, in cars passing a billboard um, is going to contain less than 71.6% of adults, right? I have a question on this one to save us. Is the intent, well, I guess my question is why? Um, is this to prevent out-of-staters from coming into California purchasing products, or is it really kind of like, for instance, I-5, right? That would qualify for this. So I guess the, is the argument behind it to prevent it on the highways or prevent it on border areas? No, the intent is clearly on highways to, to cross the border, but throughout the entire highways, because that's where our kids are riding to their <laughs> soccer games, their school, et cetera. Right, so I might make a friendly amendment just to say that we recommend to the state licensing authorities that they prohibit advertising on billboards on any highway, regardless of whether it crosses state borders, because you make a good point. I-5 would then be included. Um, this, this is Kristen. I, Kristen Nevidal. I, I'm a little concerned about the idea of eliminating all um, billboard possibility. I mean, I think that if we're looking at we're looking at retail and products, but we also have cannabis events and and the way that events are often um, advertised, especially larger events, is on billboards. And those events may be specifically for t persons that are 21 years and older. But I just I, I mean, this is incredibly expansive, and I, I have some concerns about it. I'm so, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, to me, I think the, I mean, someone asked the intent behind it. I mean, it's a state law, so, you know, what the intent behind the state law was, like, we can guess, probably multiple things went in. I think the sort of public health intent behind it is to reduce exposure of advertising, particularly to young people, because they're on the roads and they see the signs, and this is one area where I don't know how you would even show compliance with the audience composition requirement, but I'm guessing that's part of what it went into the restriction um, on billboards. To me, it's um, the request that, or at least from the subcommittee, the request is, is just that the regulation mirror what's already in state law, um, which that's the state law, so it, it um, you know, it, it sort of is what it is. We could have the second recommendation about um, maybe, you know, changing it or expanding it. Um, but I feel like that decision was part of what was balanced, you know, in creating the legal regulatory structure and the advertising and marketing rules generally, and how we were going to protect um, some groups from that advertising. Um, and it does seem like an area where the regulation has departed. I don't understand the. I mean. I actually don't understand what was behind the regulation as to why you would have a more sensitive area right near the border of the state. Um, to me, it seems like it's focused on the major highways that go through the state that cross state lines is where you want to reduce it um, because they're so well traveled. Um, so I'm not sure what the intent behind the regulation is, but I think for us to offer as a committee to, that the regulation complies with the rule that was put forth in state law is, pretty, is reasonable. Yeah, now my, the reason I brought up the intent question was because we were talking about highways, but we were also talking about near being near the, near the, the state line. And honestly, if it's good enough for California, it's good enough for <laughs> Oregon and Nevada and all those guys that come in, and why lose the revenue to it? But now that we're talking about it being more inclusive of all the highways in the state, I mean, if we were just to look at it, uh, I mean, with the DMV laws and all that stuff, underage kids, the chances of a kid driving on a highway are a lot less than a kid driving in the streets, right? And this, I'm not sure I would be able to support this one since it's all the highways. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't really have anything to do with the neighboring states and it just goes, it adds another layer of restriction. Adds another layer of restriction on the legal side of the industry. So, yeah, a lot to consider on this one. I don't think there was a second. That's... I don't think there was a second to the friendly amendment that was offered, so we shouldn't uh, get 
conflated between talking about every single street in the in the uh, in the in the state, and we're really talking about these major highways that cross state lines, and and preventing the billboards throughout the extent of those highways. Yeah, I'm gonna, this is Todd, if I can, I'm gonna move the original question that the committee adopt the subcommittee's recommendation as written. And I'll second that, this is Clifford. <coughs> Any public comment? Can we, oh, sorry. Just if I can, okay. I was just gonna make a similar point that I'm really sympathetic, this is Clifford again, I'm really sympathetic to a lot of the policy arguments being made about you know, it being too expansive and about child, you know, advertising, et cetera. But I really want to underscore, I look at the statute, and this seems like a super clear statute to me. It doesn't look ambiguous at all. It says you can't advertise on these highways across state lines. And I'm really sympathetic also to having regulations that follow the clear mandate of a statute. I feel like this decision has been made by the legislature, and we ought to have a rule that's consistent with what this says. So just want to second that point. Ms. Wu, did you? No. I, I was just looking at the regulations and wanted to comment on the same thing, okay. too. Thank you. Okay. Public comment? Go ahead. Hello again. Thank you. Lynn Silver, Public Health Institute. Um, we strongly support this measure. Um, Prop 64 was very clear on this point. We were disappointed and actually quite shocked to see the regulatory language, which our council analyzed and felt was not compatible uh, with the language in Prop 64, um, when not allowing it on major highways suddenly turned into not allowing it within 15 miles of the state border. As a result, as all of you have seen, our state highways are completely covered in cannabis billboards, which every family in a passing car is seeing. So we, at a minimum, support this. We would actually also support a complete plan on billboards in the state, as many other states legalizing cannabis have done, or at least several. I can't remember exactly which ones. Um, but what is happening today is, is truly not acceptable and, and we believe violates even the minimum language that was in Prop 64. In response to your question, the 71.6 criteria actually corresponds close to general population. There's 22% of the population is under 18. I don't have exactly how many under 21. So it, it just kept you from going for a show that was concentrated for kids, but it's not really different from, terribly different from general population. Thank you, Speaker 1. Speaker 3. Um, I remember at, um, Michelle, does it here? here? Um, at subcommittee, we discussed kind of, again, this um, enforcement versus um, drastic kind of changes. And um, we were really wanting to understand how are these billboards being enforced? And I think there's, a, a, we're really discussing this because there's so many of them up, but maybe there just needs to be kind of more guidance and more structure on um, how we regulate it. So I, I, I feel that this may be a drastic change and may affect a lot of small businesses on the side of the road. Um, maybe there needs to be more wording on limitations, but I feel completely eliminating billboards. I have two children of my own. Um, I think, you know, m m maybe I'm, a, a, you know, a cannabis mother, so it's a little different, but I honestly believe that we just need to regulate kind of what's on the boards um, a little bit just based on what we'd want our kids to see as well as how close they are to um, the freeways and what freeways but completely eliminating it's like eliminating cannabis from you know our vision as if it's not there so I just think we just need to be a little bit more uh, accommodating to a growing industry and not ignoring that it's here thank you thank you speaker three if there's any more public comments please come up and fill the seats thank you Wade Laughter, Nevada County. Um, I w I'm generally supportive of this and ask the, the committee to approve the recommendation. Uh, but it feels like we're going towards a thing where we're going to like try and pretend cannabis doesn't exist. And I think it's really a good idea for families with children to engage with their children and talk about this topic instead of pretending it doesn't exist. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker One. I really like what the previous speaker just said. Um, I'm raising my child and I'm a cannabis farmer and I don't think that we're moving forward um, from prohibition with 
regards to not allowing a billboard to be advertised for cannabis, I think that you see that for vineyards, for alcohol. So, I mean, we need to like normalize this in some way. And I also like the idea of maybe just limiting how many billboards a company is allowed to put up, something like that, so we can find a compromise to it. But I think we need to move away from uh, cannabis looking at it as like this bad thing because I don't think that it is. And the, the people of California have voted to make this be recreational, make this be a medical thing, and so we need to normalize it in some way. So thank you. Thank you, Speaker One. No more further comments, back to you, Chair. I have, I have one more comment for, for the committee. Um, I, I, I really, I understand that this is a, a, an industry that is, that is, that is going to make a lot of money, and I understand that we want to normalize cannabis. I certainly want to normalize cannabis, and I want it to be available to every adult who uses it. I am highly, highly concerned about this, um, these early days of full legalization and how we're all going to adapt as a society. It's not like alcohol because it has this medical component. And so there are mixed messages getting put out there right now, and we all know that that the power of advertising is really, really, really strong. I've been told as a parent that my message to my daughter will never get through um, the multitude of messages she gets out from the community, right? So until we, until we get to a more balanced approach generally, I think we, we really, our mandate is to protect public health and err on the side of caution um, you can always liberalize regulations. It's very hard to, to dial them back. Um, and we, we, we've all seen an explosion here in the last year of this industry and, and the advertising, the marketing, and the kids are, like youth use is on the rise. If, if whoever was at the meeting yesterday would have seen, um, I forget your name, Dr. Silver's presentation, the data show that youth use is on the rise. We know that youth use is bad for their brains, just like we know that, that kids shouldn't be drinking, kids should not be taking cannabis, right? And so I think our job here is to protect the public until we know exactly how we can live and regulate this in a safe way. I don't think that this, Tim Cermak here, I don't think this is an effort to uh, pretend that cannabis doesn't exist. I think it's more an effort to uh, give, uh, as, as you'll see later on when we talk about social media, it's, it's to give uh, parents more control over how um, awareness of cannabis is treated with their kids. Obviously, they'll never have complete control, but anything that... Um, that pushes the uh, awareness into uh, young people's minds, uh, we'd like to have, at least in the beginning, a little bit more regulation over. Uh, this is Mr. Davis. Woolsey. Uh, Mr. Okay. Woolsey's been. Uh, David Woolsey, I have a question to clarify my understanding of the recommendation so that I know um, exactly what you're recommending. So if I understand it correctly, this, this statute says no advertising on an interstate highway or on a state highway that crosses the California border, there was a regulation put out that says that applies only the within 15 miles of the border, and the recommendation is to remove that within 15 miles of the border thing so that it goes back to, the, to the, what the statute says. Is that precisely correct? Thank you. To save us, um, to clarify, based on uh, got, uh, the lady's uh, presentation yesterday, uh, she actually said the opposite. She said that, you know, based on studies, there hasn't been, there hasn't been seen an increase in teenage use, but there was an increase in young adult use, 22 and over. There has not been uh, any effect to the high school graduation rates on this stuff. And it's also one of those things where we got to normalize this. The more prohibition and stuff that's prohibited is a lot sweeter. You walk in, not even high school, you walk into a junior high, these kids are really well versed in cannabis, how to get it, how to source it, and all this stuff. So by not advertising licensed uh, businesses on billboards, we're not doing anything. It's not one of those situations where we're out of sight, out of mind, because it's always in front of them in the schools, in the schoolyards, just even outside of school. 
kids have better access to this than most adults do. They know how to go about getting it better than most adults do. <coughs> so by simply limiting it on highways or highway exposure, I don't think we're going to be combating the problem. I think the other way to go about it is to make it that much more normal and start having these conversations and allowing for some of the stuff to be in front of them. By sheltering them, we're not really helping them or protecting them. And the industry is here. Um, Prop 64 passed. We are here. We're going to move towards, um, at some point, some sort of normalization. And I think uh, it'll be a setback if we were to ban advertisements and be as restrictive in highways and all that stuff. So just a quick comment on that. The, the difference, the, 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 we're in an unprecedented situation where we have a substance that is therapeutic, used for adult use, and also has addiction potential and uh, an effect on the developing brain. So we're really in a, in a situation where we have no good precedence for understanding what should go on those advertisements. We, we saw in the presentation yesterday that the advertisements are, are really making, making claims that cannabis will make you feel better, it will, it will um, get rid of all of your ailments. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing that cannabis can't do for you. And these are, this, is, this is the messaging that kids are getting about it. They're not getting... Um, a balanced view of it. And so I think we have to take that into consideration when we're, when we're thinking about, about how to make this a, an environment that considers vulnerable populations, which include kids. And that's kind of going to my point where it's not a balanced view that they're getting and the Dominant information, most of the information that they're getting is not accurate information. It's all word of mouth. It's all school kids talking to each other. So now when we're recognizing that it's not balanced, we're taking away the only, the primary opportunity we have to balance that out. And that's with the billboard ads. That's with the legalized advertisement. That's with the responsible ones. Because again, keep in mind, kind of like the other recommendations prior to this, other recommendations and regulations and statute, there are strict guidelines with what you can and cannot advertise. So if a company goes through and they put up the advertisement and meets all the advertisement requirements, taking that away from public view and kid view, I don't think it helps our side of the argument. It doesn't help balance out the argument that cannabis is safe or cannabis is not safe. So I, I would suggest that we would never turn to the alcohol industry or the tobacco industry to use their advertising as a way of balancing out a, a, a neutral and, and uh, objective uh, perspective on their product. They're permitted to make money. Um, I, I think that the cannabis industry is permitted to make money, and so I, I, I don't buy that argument at all. And I'd like to call the question. Question has been called. I call the roll. So the motion is that the full committee recommend to the state licensing authorities to prohibit advertising on billboards on any highway that crosses state borders, specifically referencing section 26152, subsection D of the Business and Professions Code. Babouillon? No. Sir Mack? Aye. Aye. Farrow? No. Harada? Aye. Jacobson? Aye. Lynch? Nevdal? No. Nikita? Aye. Ron? Aye. Stevenson? Oh, no Stevenson? Okay. Sweeney? No. Todd? Aye. Woolsey? Aye. Wu? No. And while we're waiting for the tally, um, before you go on, Dr. Shermack, we are running against the, getting to the point where we don't have a quorum. And we have to, by law, make sure we open up for public comments not on the agenda. So I'm going to move them. As soon as they finish on items not on the agenda, then we'll go back into your order of recommendations. And this motion passes. I would hope that we'd be able to get to the uh, suggestion for agenda items uh, at our next meeting, particularly at the subcommittee meeting in December, uh, before we lose a quorum. Okay. So uh, we're taking a pause from the order of recommendations from the subcommittee on public health and youth, and we're opening up the floor to items not on the agenda, 
uh, for the public to comment on. So uh, if you'd like to speak to those, please come up. If please. all those chairs are taken, just line up in the center aisle and uh, thank you, Jeff. give you a chance to chair. Thank you. Anything, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that to you. Hi, Susan Tibben. Um, it's become increasingly apparent that legacy and heritage entities have been left out of our newly legalized industry. Program adoption is disastrously low in the very counties where cannabis has been a social, historic, and economic mainstay. There's been increased county and legislative interest in a new cottage microbusiness license as a pilot program in a designated number of counties. We respectfully request that cottage micro business be agendized at the next CAC meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker One. Speaker Two. Hello. These recommendations um, are specific to track and trace. Um, I believe that we should be allowing everyone that's in the cultivation world to combine their harvest batches together um, and then allow that to go to a distro to then be. Uh, packaged and tested um, because we're getting a lot of conflicting um, feedback from CDFA as well as metric that we're not allowed to combine harvest batches but if you manicure your plant um, let's say part of the plant and then a week later come back and harvest the other half um, the way we're getting these conflicting things is that we're not able to then put that back together and then get tested and let us let it be clear that cat 3 testing is costing around eight hundred and ninety dollars for a test so if you have a plant that only produced a couple pounds or even you just harvest that initial manicure at one pound you can do the math I mean Pounds are going for around 1100 maybe right now, so that's something we need to think about because then the cultivator makes like 200 bucks. Um, we really want to see a recommendation to allow 2,500 square feet of cultivation be added to the license type or the 25 plants. Um, and the BCC should also be pushing to reduce the taxes at the retail level as well as cultivation. Um, and then the testing requirements for the solvents that are um, used by testing labs need to be standardized. They get to pick from a many from a list of solvents, and this is where the discrepancy Thank you, comes Thank you, Speaker 2. With testing. Thank you. Speaker 3, go ahead. Hi, Paul Hansberry. I have your definition of contiguous. It's touching in contact, number one. Number two is close proximity without actually touching or neighboring. Three is adjacent in time or contiguous events. Things that are contiguous are near or next to, but not actually touching, and yet they are also defined as touching and sharing a border. You can use this adjective to describe people or things that are related to and nearby other things. It comes from the Latin word contiguous, which means pretty much the same thing as bordering upon. Because the word has two meanings, they are very similar but not always the same, it can be a bit confusing. This is an example of what's called semantic ambiguity, when something can mean more than one thing or a word or phrase is not precise. I'd love for the BCC and for the regulatory agencies to reconsider their interpretation and not be so dogmatic about the interpretation of, of contiguous because in certain jurisdictions where you may want to have a micro business but you cannot, it, if you, but you're zoned agricultural and you may not manufacture unless it's industrial, the, you can use a, a, an alternate definition of contiguous to make that, conti that conti and it, it services throughout the regulations, that this contiguous thing, if you have things that are nearby or neighboring, they should be able Thank to be included. Thank you, Speaker included. Three. Thank you. Speaker One. Hi. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mitchell Colbert. As I said earlier, I'm a lobbyist for Firefly Vapor. I'm focused on the issue of vape pen recycling. Uh, I was going to say how vape flavor, uh, how complete vape bans or flavoring bans are the wrong approach, but the letter from Americans for Safe Access we were given at the door says everything I could have said and more. Instead of telling you about how bans do not work, I'd like to ask for clarity on the issue of cannabis waste recycling, specifically for vape devices. Uh, somebody on this committee said earlier today, quote, the industry needs as much clarification as they can get around what is legal and what is not legal. 
end quote. Well, some operators, like Dosist and the numerous dispensaries they partner with, have a fully functional dispensary recycling program. Several other operators I've spoken to feel that the BCC and CDPH regulations do not presently allow for vapor cycling. I spoke to one operator yesterday who said that, since state regulations do not allow their cartridges to be handled like the e-waste they are, they need to smash them with a hammer, then mix that with other trash to be sent to the landfill. As existing non-cannabis waste regulations make clear, e-waste should not be sent to the landfill because there's a danger of contaminating the soil and groundwater. Please give cannabis operators some clarity around what is allowed under the existing regulations, and if regular, regulatory changes need to be made, please make them. Colorado just passed their Sunset Review Bill, which contains language which will allow for the recycling of all marijuana consumer waste. It would be great to see California follow in their, follow in their example. Thank, Thank you, you, Speaker One. Speaker Two, go ahead. Uh, yes, Wade Laughter, Nevada County. I wanted to ask you to explore and perhaps agendize, I'm not sure how to put this together, but something about how to encourage folks who have done this work in the past to come into the regulated system because the hoops that people have to jump through, the regulatory hurdles, the costs of licensure and permitting in local jurisdictions. In Nevada County, uh, back in 2015, uh, a local environmental organization in conjunction with several folks in the cannabis industry did a satellite survey of how many cannabis farms are commercial scale in Nevada County. In 2015, there were 3,500 more or less cannabis farms. Today, there are 19 permitted farms in Nevada County. I really think there's some issue there, a disconnect that we need to fix it's having economic effects all across Northern California in the rural areas of the state. And all of those people deserve a chance at the life that they once lived to be able to send their kids to school, to be able to pay their mortgages, and to support their families. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Two. If there are any other public comments, please come grab a seat. Um, good afternoon again, Lynn Silver at the Public Health Institute. I'd like to request that the committee agendize for the next subcommittee and committee meetings three items. Uh, the first, in light of the vaping epidemic, um, as well as increasing rates of use in pregnancy and other issues, um, methods to accurately inform the public about health risks through in-store health warnings, better package warnings, and warnings on ads. The second um, is to consider uh, which specific product classes are being designed to attract youth and should be considered to not be allowed, um, such as flavored products, products that sound like flavored bubblegum, Girl Scout cookie, et cetera, um, or can of pops that imitate alcohol pops are some examples, but to look at this key issue of how youth initiation is being um, promoted. And third, um, to look at the, to begin a more thoughtful discussion of the issue of increasing potency of products on the market and how that can be addressed with their increased risk of psychosis and addiction. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Three. No more public comments? Back to you, Chair. Thank you very much. So, uh, Dr. Cermak, you can resume. Okay. May, may I make a... May I make a suggestion, Tim? If, if it's really important that we talk about the agenda for the health subcommittee, we might want to do that before we lose quorum. Uh, is it possible for me to, at this point, give a list of things for the subcommittee uh, agenda? Well, first of all, I think as the chair of that subcommittee, you have the right to um, put forward what your agenda is for that subcommittee. So I don't know, since the Public Health and Youth Subcommittee is currently sitting, I don't know that we need to discuss if you have something you want to make sure that's okay. Discussed. Well, if although if, we would have to amend it because you've done part of it, but if it's clear in public that that I, as the chair, will have the right to put to establish the agenda. Um, you just need to make to sure meeting. we have it prior to the meeting so it can be agendized on the notice that goes out that those are the things that you'll be okay. discussing. Well, well, that's all I need to know. And to whom would I submit that, uh, those agenda items? Well, to me, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Then we can move on. Um, so this is number seven. It's um, you. 
what we're what we're looking at now in number seven is a realization that um, the question of what kind of advertising uh, should be kept from uh, from young people, what kind of advertising is not uh, attractive to young people, that that's been um, well worked out by other people, and we should uh, the, in the in the tobacco industry, not industry, but the tobacco control area, and so we should um, find a way of relying on them and seeing whether or not. Uh, their expertise would be helpful to developing some uh, regulations that would clarify things for the industry. So could you read uh, number seven, please? The recommendation is that the full committee recommend that state licensing authorities work with tobacco control experts and academics to establish stronger regulations for cannabis licensees detailing best practices for creating advertisements that are not attractive to youth. Any comments from the committee or recommendations or motions? Um, I, I hope this is uh, abundantly clear. going to work. I hope this is abundantly clear that we're trying to provide uh, regulations to give best practices to, uh, to the industry and that uh, relying on experts who have worked through this over the last few decades would be very helpful to creating those regulations. This is Kristen Evidal. I, I just am curious about why it needs to be regulations when there's already regulations, I believe, on the books that um, uh, you know, we should not be marketing towards youth. And I could see where a clear guidance document would be helpful to like highlight what's acceptable and what is borderline unacceptable, but I don't understand how, I mean, there's already regulations against this, so I don't understand, I just, I'm, I'm a little confused. I mean, it seems like a guidance document is more what we're looking for here than a, another set of regulations. But who writes the guard, guidance document? Like, who, who comes up with what goes in the guidance document? I think that's what he's, he's suggesting is that those people do that. Right, well, this says to establish regulations that, right, and I, I think the regulations are there, and I, I have no problem, I don't think, with there being some sort of a panel or group of experts to help create a guidance document, but I, I already think that it's prohibited to have, you know, child-friendly advertising on your packaging, so I'm, I just, this is where I'm a little confused yeah, on and this. Yeah, and I understand the um, clarification there. Thank you. This is Member Nikita. So in the, in the subcommittee, we looked at the regulations that exist, and it's, it's, it says essentially you shouldn't have a cartoon character or um, inflatable, you know, things like that on your, um, on your labeling or perhaps even in your advertisements. But it doesn't really, it doesn't really uh, the regulations don't, at least in our estimation yesterday, um, they're not informed by decades of work in the tobacco control space, and, and we're not suggesting that the plants are the same, but the advertising techniques for getting kids to come on board to a product are the same, and in the alcohol space as well. Initially, we had proposed a guidance document, and we got testimony in response suggesting that guidance, do guidance documents just don't work, voluntary, uh, voluntary sort of guidelines type of thing. And so this is a bit of a Swiss cheese um, wording after after some back and forth but essentially this is asking for stronger regulations and and that's that's it says what it what we intended it to say uh, we didn't we didn't believe as a subcommittee that the regulations right now actually go far enough to um, ensure that youth are not being intentionally or or inadvertently um, encouraged to start cannabis you know consuming cannabis Um, this is Matt Ron. Uh, just curious if during your conversations yesterday anybody uh, looked at the tobacco regulations to see how far in or out of alignment the cannabis regulations were. Uh, I can say that, that I haven't, and that's why I think that uh, um, people like uh, Dr. Silver uh, and other experts who have worked in that field would be able to provide us uh, information. Doesn't mean that we need to swallow them uh, or use them, but they could be useful guidelines so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
I think it's also, this is Catherine Jacobson, I think it's also a way uh, to provide clarity. So, so if someone actually looks at these regulations but, and then writes them based on what we've learned from the tobacco control experts, it also provides better clarity to the industry, which doesn't currently exist. And it's based on, on our you know, cumulative experience um, of preventing youth from starting with cigarettes or nicotine, which we have, and we can use that to the, to the benefit of, of this issue. And this is Nikita. I think that in the tobacco space, if I remember correctly, there are no regulations that um, comprehensively control advertising. It's, it's a stipulated agreement as a result of a litigation that uh, control the advertising in the tobacco space. So they may or may not be, you know, exactly what as, as a regulator informed by tobacco control experts might come up with for, for cannabis. And there may be some differences too because of the different products. So we'd want to take a more nuanced approach to that as well. But we didn't review those tobacco um, regulations or, or a stipulated agreement at all yesterday. For transparency, I was invited to go to the state's tobacco board in December and listen to where there could be some integration between what's going on with tobacco and cannabis. So I don't know what will come out of that, but maybe out of that meeting they'll want to come and address us or something too. So. Yes, yeah, so do we have a motion on, on this item? I'll, I'll make the motion that the committee uh, Adopt the recommendation number seven as drafted. Nikita. Do we have a second? Jacobson, second. Public comment on the motion. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. No other public comment? Back to the chair. Seeing no, see no further comments, uh, I'll call the roll. So this recommendation is that the full, the full committee recommend that state licensing authorities work with tobacco control experts and academics to establish stronger regulations for cannabis licensees detailing best practices for creating advertisements that are not attractive to youth. Boboyan. Nay. Sir Matt. Aye. Clifford. Aye. Farrow. Aye. Parada. Aye. Jacobson. Aye. Lynch. Aye. Nevdal. Nay. Nikita. Aye. Rod. Aye. Sweeney. Nay. Woolsey. Aye. Wu. Nay. Motion passes. Okay, the, the next recommendation, uh, we're, we're, oh, yeah. we're more than halfway through. <laughs> One second. <Please. laughs> but the next recommendation um, is really in relationship to the 71.6 uh, percentage that need to be o over 21, the audience for any, any advertising. And uh, the way it's currently set up is that if requested, um, those people who are placing advertisements uh, would have that data to, to produce to show that, in fact, they are uh, reaching audiences that are at least 71.6% uh, 21 and older. And uh, so could we read that? It was recommendation eight. Dr. Sermon. Okay. So recommendation eight is that all three licensing agencies require any licensee who is placing ad advertisements to publicly disclose their audience composition data as required by 265151B of the Business and Professions Code. So since they, uh, they are required to have this data, we are just asking that it be uh, routinely public rather than only at the uh, behest of a request. Can I, uh, this is uh, Matt Ron, can I just ask um, for sort of a point of clarification? I'm 
I'm not getting the greatest uh, signal down here for internet access and don't have in front of me that business and professions code. So just a quick summary on what that actually says. If we can, do we have that handy here? Coming to you shortly. Thank you. B. Yeah. 26151. Yeah. 26151B simply says any advertising or marketing placed in broadcast, cable, radio, print, and digital communications shall only be displayed where at least 71.6 of the audience is reasonably expected to be 21 years of age or older as determined by reliable, up to date audience composition data. So there's no guidance given then is what I'm trying to understand. No guidance given in how that data are, how they are collected. It's just, you know, within the code itself, it says as determined by reliable up-to-date audience composition data. So are there any specifics on what that means? Because otherwise I'm a little worried about what we're, what we're saying here. Um, you know, if there aren't any standards of practice for determining 71.6%. So I can speak to what's in the Bureau's regulations related to that, and that would be 5040 of the Bureau's regulations. Um, subdivision C says, for the purposes of this section, reliable up-to-date audience composition data means data regarding the age and location demographics fix of the audience viewing a particular advertising or marketing medium. Reliable up-to-date audience composition data does not include data from the most recent United States decennial or special sentences or the annual population estimate for California counties published by the Demographic Research Unit, State Department of Finance. And then we go on to indicate that that information has to be um, provided to the Bureau on request. So, so absent Census Bureau data or other as mm -hmm. described, then where are they getting this data from? <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that? So, so it's just not clear. So absent, because typically we use Census Bureau data or other, you know, like data, because that's kind of, although we know there's a gap in that, kind of the most up to date. So, so are they actively going out and collecting data on establishing that population? Is that what we're... That's, they, they, should, they should be doing that. That's what they're required to do. Under the statute, they can't place an advertisement unless there's a chart nomination that... 71.6 of the intended audience is going to be um, 21 or older. I just, I, I mean, as somebody who's been practicing statistics as an academic for like 25 years, that's just, I would love to see how that's done. That is just fascinating to me. Um, <laughs> because, you know, if you were to tell me, you know, you've got $100,000 to do a study on, on, you know, determining composition of age of somebody who looks at a sign, um, I just, I wouldn't even know how to begin. Um, so absent any clear direction, aside from the fact that you can't use Census Bureau data, um, you know, even, I, I, you know, how do you even do car counts or, you know, I mean, it just, I, I mean, it just frankly seems kind of absurd. Um, this is, not a, this is not an effort to, to make every business have to go out and do polling. That, that would be absurd and, and too expensive. Um, my assumption is that there, there should be, um, since this is in the statute, there should be a way that it is uh, well known that, uh, you know, the Los Angeles Times is read by people that fall into the right uh, demographic category. but. Uh, but some comic book is falling into the wrong category. Um, and, and perhaps it would be necessary for uh, the agencies to um, give some guidance in terms of how that is to be determined. If determining it is, is a, an overdue burden to each, uh, each portion of the industry, um, 
then clearly the, the agencies should give some guidance for how that is to be determined, whether or not they're placing advertisements in uh, places that have been validated to fall in the right demographics. Well, and I think you made my point uh, there. Uh, mm -hmm. be, because I, I think I was it, agreeing with you yeah. in a very long way. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> because, because without an industry standard on how Sorry. on how those data are collected or, or analyzed or how a conclusion is, is reached without an industry standard on this, it's what up to the business to establish that standard or, you know, so before we make a recommendation like this, I'd rather see us focus on, you know, creating a standard for assessment or making that recommendation right. at least. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'd be better off making a recommendation back to the Bureau on how they would go about creating that standard. and. And that way it could be followed. I mean, you're right. And again, I'll be just fascinated to see what that looks like because I'm still, I'm still not clear how you would ever, you know, be able to accomplish something like that. And so. just a point of clarification, the advertising requirements actually apply to all licensees, not just bureau licensees. Um, the bureau happens to have some further information in its regs about what it considers and what reliable data and what it doesn't consider reliable data, um, but that is actually the statutory determination. Um, in the statute is this audience composition data, and um, so it essentially calls for market research of some sort. Uh, and I have a question. Was, it, was there any thought given, I'm sorry, David Woolsey, was there any thought given to, uh, by making the audience composition data public, uh, the, the problem with the proprietary proprietariness, that's probably not the right word, um, of the data. So I'm a marketing company. I conduct this research. You pay me a lot of money to get the research for your business. Um, my com your competitors don't pay me a lot of money, so you have an advantage, a, a marketing advantage, because now you know who your target audience is and that you meet this, this requirement. By making that data public, you've paid for something, and now all your competitors get it for free because it's made public, right? I think the Bureau already has the authority if they see an advertisement and they're like, ooh, I don't know about this one. I think this is advertised on the wrong radio station or the wrong TV station or the wrong print media. The, the Bureau and the CDPH and the CDFA apparently in the statute already have the authority to say, hey, show me where it says, show me your data that says that that's okay for you to advertise there. And then they could give it to them without disclosing who you hired for your, your marketing team uh, to promote your business. So. Uh, was there any thought given to that in relation to making that information public? Well, I think these are all really good points and well taken. Um, as it currently stands, uh, they are required to do this, to produce this. Um, and so it, before facing the issue of whether or not it would be public or not, I think it prob we probably need to step back and, and ask the... Uh, the authority or the agencies to determine or um, describe uh, how how this regulation, as it currently stands, is to be uh, satisfied. Dr. Sermak, I know that I was on one of the initial subcommittees before temporary re or draft regs and permanent regs came out, and we did we had a lot of discussion on the manufacturing, and it looked like the state had a pretty clear understanding of how they would be able to market and package, you know, on packaging and on literature on what would be, you know, not permitted for uh, attracting children. Um, but it would, but I, I now hear the idea of market, you know, hiring a marketing survey to make sure they meet that. I would assume that if somebody were to put, here's where I think the biggest problem is. If you see something that specifically you think targets children, not just there's a package that says cannabis on it, then you should share that with the agency so they can investigate and then demand that information from them. Um, but I think if we're trying to say every package, that ha every billboard, everything that has to do with cannabis has to have this market research provided by the employer is overly burdensome. We'll never get to the core of the, all the problems. We won't deal with the vaping crisis. We've got to be very specific. Because, you know, there's only so much time to get this stuff done, and I'm, that's my biggest concern, is we're going get, to get into, you know, whether my kid sees a square and says, oh, that's a building block, or another kid sees a square and says, what is that? Um, that's, that's my concern. And if, if that billboard is in an area, even though there may be children in the car, the real window of 
people, the majority of people that are going to be in the car that might see that are going to be between the ages of 16 and 18 that might be youthful or not 16 and 21. What is that number versus the vast majority that be over 21? So, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. I, we need to take a break for a minute because we have uh, some emergency needs to take care of. So I will, we'll resume this in a second. No. Somebody else bounced. Back at it. So, Back at it. Con continue. Before you start, I just want to make a point for the record, but I'll wait for my court reporter to get here, that the public health and youth recommendation number six passed. I, I know I was counting that, but I could put on the record that that motion passed. Right. So we didn't have a motion yet on recommendation number eight, which was to provide the data used to. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask the uh, the people on the subcommittee whether or not they're willing uh, willing to withdraw this recommendation at this point for further study, uh, rather than proceeding on it further. Um, thank you for this is uh, Kristen Lynch speaking in support of um, withdrawing that at this point I was on the public health subcommittee yesterday and I think given the questions that have been raised and legitimate um, concerns um, they call into question my you know recommendation and so I'd like to you know withdraw or at least table that for now for the full committee's consideration. Are there any objections from people on the subcommittee? Okay. Right. What, the, the only thing is I'm trying to think of Robert's rules here, and I don't know that you could withdraw, but you could table it for discussions at a future date, or you can um, have it die for failure of a motion. But I don't know that you can, because you had a committee that made oh. the motion. So um, mm -hmm. my recommendation would probably either um, do one of the two that I suggested, so that way we're in compliance. Either uh, make a recommendation to table, oh, well, okay. or, or let it die. Ask for a uh, first and second. If it dies, then you can bring it up at a future meeting. If so it doesn't really matter either way. No. Uh, can we declare it dead, and then we'll we'll discuss well, it? Let me ask first if there's a motion and a second. And okay. If we don't get a motion and a second, then we can then say that. So do we, have a, do we have a motion for item number eight from the committee? So move. All right, having none. Uh, oh, I don't know where we are. Move on to number nine. Okay, so we go on to number nine. And um, this is an interesting one uh, because as we were thinking through 71.6, uh, one of the things we were realizing is um, that we needed to get into social media and uh, that's a difficult topic for everyone, for a committee that's made up only of adults. But um, we, what we came to is a realization that social media has the uh, potential for um, directing messages and directing messages to um, uh, demographics that, that we want those messages not to be, uh, not to be receiving. So um, let's go ahead and read um, Recommendation number nine, if we could. So the recommendation is that the full committee recommends that state licensing agencies consider and adopt appropriate regulations to prevent cannabis advertising from using online or digital ads that directly target those under 21. We know that um, social media is very good at targeting people in uh, different demographics. And uh, I forget the wording that uh, Tamara um, Colson that you used about um, not being able to provide information directly to um, un people under 21, but it fell nicely within that as so, well. So, you yeah, the statute has a provision that basically says that if you're doing direct individualized communication that you can't you have to verify the person is 21 or older and 
and every website I've ever been to has our U21 or over. Now that's not to say that there may be other people out there on their own doing something, but I don't know how the state would monitor that. This is member Nikita. So the, the, these ads sort of live in a, our discussion yesterday, these ads live in a weird space between the direct advertise, the, the direct personalized, you know, hey, you know, Joe, come look at my product uh, website or buy my product and, and the billboard in the sense that they appear largely um, on the borders of your browser or on your phone if you're looking at a site. We've all seen them. You, you look at a pair of shoes on a website and they follow you for a week. Um, that, these are the types of ads we're talking about and they use uh, algorithms and we're, we were sort of, um, uh, to use uh, Member Ron's term a few moments ago to me, unencumbered by technical expertise and so we don't really know, we didn't know how to draft this in a way to get at the point but really what we're saying is that the, the social media advertising or digital advertising is a new frontier, it's not like a billboard, it's not like a radio and it's changing all the time and there's a lot of uh, power over where to place those ads and companies have a lot of ability to direct those ads to those who who might want to use the product and they also have the ability to limit the types of ads that they place uh, before those who are 21 and we were asking the the bureau actually all three licensing agencies because what we found out yesterday is that the responsibility for governing the licensing of a license the advertising of a licensee falls to the agency that licensed it so a, a cultivator Cultivators advertising is governed by um, by food and ag and, and the manufacturers is governed by CDPH. And so we were, we were asking all three agencies to explore the issue of um, digital advertising and ensure that what has happened in the space of um, e-cigarettes, um, which, is, which is now pretty evident from, from media reports, those advertisements were directly placed in the in front of viewers who were under 21. That that doesn't happen in the cannabis space, and so we were asking for a deeper dive into this issue. We don't know what exactly the appropriate regulations are. We're not being prescriptive, but we we know that this this is not addressed at all in the regulations now. We want to acknowledge that this this is a really new area. Um, that requires some study and, and some regulations. Um, we don't even, there, there are advertising uh, means through influencers, et cetera, on, on social media that uh, I don't think anyone has developed uh, a framework for understanding exactly how that is to be regulated. So we thought we'd start with a little bit smaller and, and begin to ask that uh, regulations be developed to uh, cover the uh, social media targeting. Um, this is Kristen Evidal. Um, I, I do believe that most social media platforms have a minimum age in order to be involved. And I, I, you know, like, I'm pretty sure that Facebook is 18. Um, and while youth is our while youth are using these social media platforms, they are lying about their age to sign up to participate in a social media platform and so I really have a hard time understanding how we would from a cannabis perspective regulate the illegal usage of a social media platform to ensure that cannabis advertising is not getting to people under 21. I just I'm I'm a little lost there. My teenagers have all been on social media and they've all lied about their age to get I'm, on there. I'm early. lost with you, but we certainly know that if someone came into a dispensary and you asked them, are you 21 or older, and they said yes, you'd want some verification. <laughs> you don't just go with them saying yes. And yet that's what the, uh, that's what the digital world does. Mm -hmm. So I don't have an answer to this, but I recognize a problem. Right, but the but the, Kristen, again, the digital world does not require verification, and so this is this is my point exactly. So, how would we, as cannabis businesses or even as regulatory agencies, regulate the underage use on social media platforms that are not doing their job in verifying the age? I mean, this is this is the the crux of the question here for me. Is like there's no way for a business to verify that the majority of the folks on those social media platform are 
18 or 21 years or older because the platforms themselves are not verifying the age of the user on that platform. So it seems to me like this would be kind of virtually impossible for a regulatory agency to wrap something meaningful around when the platforms themselves are not adhering to a verification process to begin with. Right, because it's difficult um, doesn't mean it's impossible and that's why we put the word consider. It's something that needs to start being studied. I think that just saying, oh man, we don't know what to do is not a reason to throw up our hands and not start considering what could be done. Well, we are an advisory committee. Do you have any suggestions on how they could do that, or do you, or, or in your network, the people that you met with? I'm 74 they... years old. I, I <laughs> no, no. Okay. Um, because I mean, that, that would be mean there aren't I think experts we could, if we who could can come start back, working at this. What's that? That doesn't mean that there aren't experts who can. That's start what I'm wondering if there is that we could then source that data so that way when we have our next meeting we could then present that type of information. Because again, I, I tend to agree. I mean, I know my kid lied about his age to get on Facebook when he was, you know, 16 or 15 or whatever he was doing, so. Um. Well, I, but I would contend that, that the statute says that advertising to people under 21 is illegal and You did. And the agencies are tasked with developing regulations to implement that. Right. And so I'm recommending that they get working on it. Okay. Um, this is this is Kristen Navarro again. I'm based on the statute and having to show that you have 70 some odd percent. I can't remember the exact number. My apology. Um, uh, age 21 and over. If the minimum age is 18 technically for all of these platforms, they're going to qualify for the 70% of 21 and over viewership. I mean, just right out the gate. So I, I, I really fail to see how an agency, a cannabis agency, is going to manage this without going back to the social media companies and saying, you have to prove that each of these persons on your platform is 18 or 21 so that your statistics that you put out are actually real. And so I, I don't think that this is doable from an agency perspective. I think this is an issue with verification of the platforms. And um, I think the guidance about what's appropriate advertising and making sure that the advertising is not kid friendly covers this without having to go here. I mean, that's my read on it. Eric Carada, I, I agree with Member Nevidal. I think uh, the three licensing agencies only has authority to regulate industry licensees. And I think what you're gonna run into is a lot of third party providers, unlicensed entities doing advertising perhaps on behalf of these uh, licensed retailers and again the the three licensing agencies wouldn't have uh, any type of regulatory authority over over reposts and third party providers so it would be very difficult i think perhaps the answer is already in 26152 subdivision e which is uh, advertise or market cannabis or cannabis products in a manner intended to encourage persons under 21 of age to consume cannabis or cannabis products perhaps including uh, to include social media by licensees Mr. Ron? Yeah, so uh, do we know this is an issue? I mean, have the licensing agencies received information or complaints that say there are, you know, licensed companies targeting underage advertising on social media? I think that's for you, either. Uh, this is Miriam from Public Health. We have not received anything that specific. Or, or, or even generally, I mean, do we do we know that this is an emerging issue? Has anybody, you know, I mean, outside of the the weed maps, you know, uh, space, I mean, are we are we seeing this on on social media or other platforms where where this is coming up as an issue? We were presented uh, information in in an informational presentation by Dr. Silver regarding that. I think one of the things that we have heard that we are seeing in social media is the illicit pop-up shops. Well, and, and I guess that's kind of where I was going with it, right? Yeah. Is that are we, you know, I, I mean, you know, obviously dealing with this from an illicit 
business perspective versus those who are operating legally uh, in this space. Mm -hmm. Um, those are those are two very different issues, and so if we if we're not confident that those legitimate businesses in California are in fact targeting underage, you know, uh, uh, marketing or, or advertising on social media, then you know, are we asking the licensing entities to, you know, address something that may not be an issue? Right. So if I don't have that information in front of me, I'm not sure I can, you know, say one way or the other because we just, you know, it's it's speculative at best. Uh, this is Avis. Also, the websites that are up, everyone's got the are you verify you're over 21 stuff. When we talk about the Instagrams, the Facebooks and the Twitters, they set the algorithm. So it's not the company that's advertising. It's not the company that's putting up a post. It's Facebook, it's Instagram, it's Twitter that's setting out the algorithm. And that algorithm is based off of that specific user. So if you go look at shoes for the next two, three months, you're going to be looking at a lot of random uh, shoe advertisements. So why penalize the company? And again, if we're talking about licensed versus unlicensed market, all the set of regulations in the world are not going to impact on licensed markets. So any regulation that we put out, it's just going to be setting back the licensed operator that's trying to go about it the right way. Another way to take a look at this is if you're trying to target the unlicensed operators and start enforcing against them, if they're putting up advertisement, that's your proof that they're conducting commercial cannabis activity without a license, and that should go towards more uh, for your enforcement efforts than, again, penalizing the licensed operator. Because again, what we're also talking about directing uh, advertisement towards underage people, A, the license holder doesn't have an incentive to do that because that's not going to translate into a transaction. And when that uh, underage person walks into a shop, they're going to be carted, they're <coughs> going to be turned around. So sending out additional stuff in the other side of it is this, the canvas industry as it is, is extremely limited in the channels that they can use for advertisement. Um, for the Instagrams, most companies set up two, three sep uh, separate Instagram accounts because they constantly get shut down once Instagram starts picking up on it that they are advertising for a Canvas product. So I don't think the solution would be uh, more regulations because all the regulations that we're going to be putting together or recommending to put together target the license holders, which the license holders aren't responsible for any of this. And the only thing I'd say is that in, in a previous life, on another controlled substance, you know, we had situations where employer, where certain companies weren't IDing people or were selling to minors, and we just simply called ABC. ABC sent them a letter, I gave them a cease and desist, then they investigated it, and lo and behold, they stopped selling to minors or got cited if they continued. So, I mean, if there are people out there, one, I think you'd catch them if, if you know that they're doing it. You'd catch the ones that are probably not licensed, and we need to shut them down anyways because you can't have a commercial market that's not paying their fair share of taxes and following the rules. Um, and the sooner we do stuff like that, the easier it will be to make sure that the legal market doesn't start slipping back into an illegal market because it's the only way they can make money. And, I mean, that's my bigger fear is if we don't start to shut down the illegal market, uh, this whole effort to try to make this product available to people who use it responsibly will be jeopardized. So, Well, I, I do reject the argument that um, you, you say I place an advertisement in a certain channel and uh, where that goes is not my responsibility. That I would reject that, no, ar I, that argument. I understand that. So is there a motion on this recommendation? I'm interested in making sure that we have public comment on this, so I so move. Do I have a second? Nikita will second. Public comment? Public comment. Go ahead, Lynn. Right. We're going to clarify the adopt the recommendation as written, as read. I would just um, clarify, I think the reason why we previously, uh, and actually this committee previously recommended a change to the criteria recommended by the Institute of Medicine for advertising targeting to 85%, which would require a statutory change um, by the legislature, was exactly to facilitate um, this type of enforcement because if you actually want to do this type of enforcement, you have to have a clear criteria, you know, when you buy social media time, you say, I want a market that looks, well, you know how you do it, you say, I want a market that looks, you know, this age, this type. 
Um, and if I had a clear criteria that allowed me to um, say this buyer is targeting young people, I could it would be much more feasible to enforce. So I would again encourage um, the licensing agencies to support legislative change um, to have a clearer youth criteria that would facilitate uh, better enforcement for social media. Thank you, Speaker One. Speaker Three. Wade Laughter, Nevada County. <clears throat> Um, I wanted to uh, follow up with what uh, Ms. Nevidal was saying. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm, not, I'm also not very versed in the uh, interwebs thing, but <laughs> I, I do go on Instagram occasionally, and I'm amazed at the number of clearly young people that are on Instagram. And <clears throat> I'm not sure how... Uh, all of this is good when you're talking about folks who are actually trying to obey the rules, who are who have gotten their license, who've gotten their permit. They're actually trying to obey the rules. This is all good, and all of these sanctions and everything, it's it will work for them. They're not the problem. They're not the problem. And I and I think really at root. A lot what this body and our legislature and the regulatory bodies in the cannabis space need to do is really focus on how do we discourage the illegal operators and encourage the legal operators. That's all I have. And I had neglected to do this early on, but I really want to thank each and every one of you for what you are doing here today. This is important work. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Three. If there are any more public comments, please fill the seats as they become available. Sorry. Um, Michelle Desitzer, uh, Cannabox. Um, I think it's important that we don't turn back time. Um, advertisements are, you know, extremely important. And, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not as good of a speaker as some of the other presenters, so I apologize uh, if I stumble. But um, the data that we we gather is extremely important and we have to make sure that we are not sending the wrong message with these industry regulations um, all i can you know all i can ask is that you consider rereading the way we wrote this and um, really you know really understand that licensed businesses are not really targeting that age group. I'm a licensed business, I am an operator. We focus so much on following the law to a T. I read every single bit of law. Um, I am you know, familiar with many people in the industry. We are so focused on doing the right thing. Please understand that this may be an issue in the illicit market, but the legal market is really trying. Work with them. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Three. Seeing no more public comments, back to you, Chair. Well, um, I'd like to make a comment. And um, I actually um, believe that it's very, very likely that the, uh, the legal market is, uh, is not the ones that are primarily uh, causing some of the problems on the Internet that, that have been documented for us by Dr. Silver. Um, the, the purpose of having a regulation sometimes is to um, have additional ways of enforcing um, enforcement of illegal guys, gals. You know, we, need, we don't have enough enforcement now, and sometimes having additional regulations as a way of enforcing the illegal market and forcing it out of business is part of the purpose of, of a uh, recommendation like this. Thank you, Dr. Shermack. So Mr. we have Chair. a motion Mr. Uh, Chair, one and more. a second. One more comment. I just want to say that the, the last speaker did speak quite well, and I think she spoke accurately when she said, let's not turn back the clock. I think a regulatory system that addresses advertising but fails to address digital advertising is it just doesn't get there. I mean, this is one of the biggest growing advertising um, methods out there. It's billions of dollars in revenue, and, and we just don't have anything on it right now. And so this, this was just, you know, this is asking the agencies to consider that. Okay. 
But yes, Lori. So I just want to respond that we get a lot of advertising complaints for all sorts of things, and we investigate every one right now. So if there's a problem and we have a licensee that is advertising and it's illegal, we, uh, we take action. Uh, so this, we're not hindered by anything right now. We can go after any licensee that's not advertising as laid out in the statute and the regulations. Yeah, you know, this is uh, Matt Ron. I, I would just comment to, you know, not to highlight it too much, but it's a great law enforcement tool. I mean, the more folks are actually conducting, you know, especially those illicit, act, uh, you know, businesses advertising online, you know, where they are and who they are. I mean, you know, um, I, you're, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think you see a lot of the, you know, legally licensed businesses, you know, conducting those types of activities. And so, um, you know, it's a, uh, it's an interesting tool that can be used right now um, in uh, in dealing with uh, a lot of the illicit business. So we have a motion and a second. Can we take the roll? So the motion is that the full committee recommends that state licensing agencies consider and adopt appropriate regulations to prevent cannabis advertising from using online or digital ads that directly target those under 21. Bobulian. Nay. Sir Mack. Aye. Clifford. No. Barrow. No. Harada. Nay. Lynch. Yes. Nevdal. Nay. Nikita. Aye. Ron. Nay. Sweeney. Woolsey? Nay. No. Motion fails. So I'd ask for the last two items that you have, is it possible to combine those two I in think motion? it is. Um, it. And actually, uh, both of these are, are, are more requests than uh, uh, recommendations for, for regulations. Um, this, is, uh, this is started off with talking about counterfeit uh, cannabis products and the uh, first recommendation is just for the bureaus to um, to provide us some uh, additional information about the extent of uh, counterfeit uh, cannabis products um, uh, both in the regulated and, and illicit markets and um, what enforcement actions are being taken so just uh, recommending that that information be provided us by the agencies so that we can uh, further look at that issue. And the second one uh, is, again, uh, re uh, requesting information uh, from the Department of Public Health, much of which we might have gotten today already, but it's uh, regarding the um, toxicological data used to determine uh, allowable ingredients in uh, vape pens and the level of allowable ingredients and uh, any, uh, any parameters related to the hardware of the vape pens uh, in order to determine uh, what, uh, what constitutes uh, uh, allowable vaping products. So, so um, it's just a request um, for the subcommittee to be provided that information by the agencies. Do we have any questions or comments by the committee? Any motion by the committee? Member Nikita will move both, uh, both recommendations one and two as drafted. Lynch seconds. Do we have any public comment on either of those two uh, recommendations? No public comment. We're going to read Seeing none, <coughs> we'll call the question. So the first recommendation is that the Bureau and the Department of Public Health 
provide the committee with information about the extent of counterfeit cannabis products in the regulated and illicit markets and what enforcement actions are being taken about those counterfeit products. The second recommendation is that the California Department of Public Health present to the committee toxicological data used to determine allowable excipients in vape pens, the level of allowable excipients in vape pens, and any parameters related to the hardware of those vape pens themselves to determine what constitutes a safe vaping product for the public. The bullion. Aye. Sir Mack. Aye. Sir Mack. Aye. Clifford. Aye. Farrow. Aye. Harada. Aye. Lynch. Aye. Nevdal. Aye. Mejia. Aye. Ron. Aye. Sweeney. Aye. Woolsey. Aye. Wu. Aye. Motion passes. So, so on behalf of the subcommittee, I'd like to thank the full um, Cannabis Advisory Committee for taking these uh, issues seriously and providing the very valuable uh, feedback that you've given us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shermack. So we have one item left on the agenda, and I can notice that there's a little bit of, like, people are a little bit worn out. It's been a long day. We've got a lot of good work done. But this is really important part because often people afterwards say, I'd like to have had input on the next meeting's agenda. And, you know, though I'll be working with staff to come up with the agenda, and as soon as we get a location, we'll get that out to you as soon as possible. But uh, are there any agenda items that the committee really feels like we should tackle next time? Or are there any guest speakers that you feel are important that we add? We had some really ter terrific speakers today. Um, sorry, I didn't make any of the speakers yesterday. I wasn't uh, feeling a little under the weather. So, um, so with that, is there anybody who has any recommendations? Or um, I, I think it would be great to have some. Oh, this is Kristen of it all. Sorry. Um, I think it would be really helpful to have some presentation around CEQA and how it is moving forward and progressing um, throughout the state. And within that, I'd also like to see. Um, a report back from Department of Fish and Wildlife that helps us understand um, region by region um, how many, um, oh, what are they called, um, self-certifications have been issued, how many standard lake and stream bed alteration agreements have been issued, and then the other, there's two types of lake and stream bed alteration agreements. So I would really appreciate um, numbers around what's been applied for by region, what's been issued by region, and then how much those um, lake and stream bed alteration agreements are costing. Um, because getting through that process, um, not just dealing with the local sequel component, but getting through that lake and that fish and wildlife process is timely, and it is, I believe, costing most farmers tens of thousands of dollars and outdoor cultivators are not allowed to self-certify, even if they have zero, um, zero um, lake and stream bed alterations. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? I'd also like to offer up that, you know, historically, I've always asked for data to hear about more data uh, to, to understand what's going on in the industry, to understand if, you know, we're having an impact in terms of what we're trying to achieve. Um, you know, the nice thing about the industry having evolved for a number of years now is that there are a number of third-party, you know, d data aggregation companies out there that track, uh, you know, sales data, all sorts of data. Um, you know, I'd offer up to at least, you know, and just in my dealings with the industry, I've, I've come to know a lot of these companies, and I'm sure we can get some of these guys to come in here and present whatever, you know, we, we can make a request list, frankly, to some of these guys say, we'd like to understand all this, and uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to come in and, uh, present on some of this data. So I'd at least volunteer that up that if you know, this this committee is interested in having people come in like that, I'm sure I could go out there and find a couple of these companies that are willing to come in and just present. Uh, yes. Uh, I, w I would like to make sure that there is a, uh, a robust report on what's happening in the equity space. Um, and I believe... Uh, we had a distribution of uh, revenue, and so if, if we can have some sort of update 
uh, on on the equity space and and how is that program working? Well, it's already okay. Yeah, they, no, I know. They, That's they, they sent us that particular uh, data already. I think that ten million dollars finally got out. Right. Okay. So I would like to know uh, what they're doing with it. What they're doing with it. I'd like to know how the program is working. If, if we if we have any demographic data okay. on that. Okay. Very good. Okay. I had asked Tim Cermak here. I, I had asked uh, if someone from uh, Department of Public Health could come and uh, review the uh, website uh, Let's Talk Cannabis, uh, particularly its metrics and what the plans are for the future. And I was told that uh, they were unable to have anyone uh, come, uh, at least to this meeting. So I, I think that could be valuable. You're talking matrix on the track and trace system, or matrix is in the term matrix? Metrics. Uh, okay, oh, metrics. Uh, yeah, metrics on their okay. Let's Talk Cannabis website, okay. which is the primary um, public education right. that, that's occurring at this point. Okay, anything else? Yes, uh, and this may be uh, re redundant or repetitive, but uh, we, we did have a presentation, and I wanted to make sure um, uh, from the governor's office, uh, the representative, I wanted to make sure that uh, we got that document, that all of us yeah. could get that document. So I just want to reemphasize that. Reemphasize that. Thank yeah, you. I, I think we, if, I'm sure we'll be fine getting that. Anything else? Lori, do you want anything else to consider? Oh, okay. All right, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> All right so we have public comment on these uh, recommendations. Do you have any recommendations that you'd like us to tackle? Please come up and share them with us, or if you want to comment on any of the recommendations that were made. If not, have a great day. Oh, yes. see. You almost Speaker hesitated White, to I feel like a pest here. Um, Lynn Silver, PHI. Um, I think I would just ask if the enforcing agencies could also come back to the um, advisory committee with a position on the recommendations. So um, we've made a bunch of, you, you've made a bunch of public health recommendations and other recommendations. Um, you know, are, is, are the enforcing agencies coming back to say, yes, we're going to do this, no, we're not going to do this for this reason or that reason. Um, we think this is a good idea or a bad idea, but do, are you getting... Um, a final position on what and where these go. That was just a question. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. No more public comment. Back to chair. Well, thanks for bearing with us all day. It was a great day, and uh, we're adjourned until December. Thank you. Thanks.